For Arts and Adventure Summit Sea Airwaves, this is the Ogden Arts and Adventure Show. I'm our brand along, along with Todd, no longer to the top, Oberndorfer. It's just assumed now. Presumed. Presumed. Made it to the top. Presumed. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's hanging out on top. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Uh, guests this week include, now, would you like to categorize yourself? Because Todd and I switched up the, the format for this show. And then, um, so we have one arts guest and one adventure guest. And so because you're a power couple in both the arts and adventure, we have the McLeods here. Um, Cam McLeod and Kelly, I think they know each other or have known each other. It's not a Cupid situation. For a while. Uh, yeah. So Cam, by, for a living, is, you would say, an adventure photographer? Yeah, that's... That or or would you go, or would you go like... Fine art photography. How do you define your photography? We're gonna go right into this podcast, I guess. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I can't. Uh, how do I? <laughs> yeah, we're coming adventure, up the hard ones quick. Photography is like where I began my journey, I would say. And that's, when someone just asks you, is that the easiest answer? No, I say I'm a commercial and editorial photographer. And then they have no idea what you're talking about. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then that requires a whole bunch of okay. qualifiers. Yeah, we don't have time that's, that. <laughs> right, <so that's> <laughs> Okay, Kelly, uh, you, are, you, are, you are now heavily involved in the arts here in Ogden, correct? What's your p- current position? Uh, currently, I am the president of the board for Ogden Contemporary Arts. Okay. Tell everyone who doesn't know what Ogden Contemporary o- OCA is for short. What is that? Yeah, so Ogden Contemporary Arts, we call it OCA. Um, they are uh, a, a tripping over my words. <laughs> they're yeah. they're uh, a local nonprofit arts organization that sits here inside the Monarch off of 25th Street. Um, and they really like to focus and strive to be globally influencing within um, their arts. So they have a lot of local and national artists that come to Oka. Todd, break that down for me. Okay, so it, it's right there. You can see they're almost, they're right there. <laughs> It's gallery space, really it's programming, we'll yeah. get into it. It's arts residencies. Um, it's it's more than just a gallery space. I would definitely say that. Um, and then we, we can talk a little bit more about the structure on that one. Sure. I would like to find out right away when you started your position, because it's pretty fresh, Yep. and how you got the position. I always use it as an example. There was one day, and you guys know this, on the Arts Advisory Committee. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been there for four years I think about four years, I believe I've missed one meeting. And what happened in that one meeting? You got voted to be the president. The vice, the vice chair. Pre- vice yep. chair. And the vice, vice chair. chair inherits the chair. Which is the first chair. step to... Yeah, yeah. Pro- no, the first step is missing a chair. meeting. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, is that I missed one meeting. Um, without my knowing, I got voted... Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so is so this how it happens over there? did you miss over there? <laughs> <laughs> Something I might not be aware of. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, I uh, started being getting involved with OCA because Cam did a show there in June of 21, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and so through that, I got to work with the executive dress director, Vanessa Castagnoli, and spent a lot of time with OCA and obviously helping to promote Cam's show. Um, in collaboration with other artists. It wasn't just his show. But um, and through that time, I got to really learn more about Oka and what they do and where they were going and um, raised some money for Cam's show, which then allowed me to have a little foot in the door to sit on their board. Um, and then from there, their president was already at the end of her two-year term, and they asked if I would be vice president for one year to learn from her. And I said, sure, let's try it. Um, and then that was obviously uh, just a year ago. So I started as president in September of this year. And what is your extensive arts uh, management background? Um, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but the management yeah, okay. side of things. Yeah, I definitely help. I, I'm heavily involved in, in Cam's business. Um, and if you can manage Cam. Yes. Okay. That is okay. a feat in and of itself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but why would are you being facetious or do you does he require heavy management? Like, did you how much did you learn managing a professional photographer? 
Um, well, I think it's still learning. Yeah, definitely still learning. But I think like you said earlier, everybody has a hard time kind of managing themselves. Yeah. And so Cam has always been a team of one. So having anybody he can work with and collaborate with is really helpful. And people have strong suits and weaknesses. And obviously we are two different people and his strong suits are my weaknesses and vice versa. That's, so, that's a fantastic coupling. Yeah. Um, when you tell him what to do and he says, don't tell me what to do, how does that go? Do you have to remind him you're the boss or how does that work? Or is he the boss? <laughs> is this the therapy session? That, I, I was know just about? curious. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he just wants Are we going to get a bill wants- for this? <laughs> 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 we don't have good insurance. Um, uh, you know, it's been, I mean, I've been doing this now with him for two years full time. Sorry. Um, the reason I ask is because there are couples in the same scenario and they can learn from you if you figured stuff out. That's I'm not trying oh, no, to put no. you on the spot, but I am. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're fine. We've been working together for two years full time in this situation. We've learned a lot, still are learning a lot. It's enhancing our communication skills in marriage and in business. I bet. Um, there's hard days and easy days. There's, you know, it's kind of a roller coaster, just like any job. So I would say uh, we just keep learning and keep working through it. But you worked a different job for a long time. Yeah. And so is it better now that you're both like on the same calendar and have the same sort of schedules or how does that work? It's a lot easier. I was in healthcare administration for 15 years. Um, and so it's a lot easier now working with him from like a social lifestyle perspective, being able to plan vacations. Sometimes I get to go and obviously work in some of the jobs that he does have. Um, cause I also act as a producer for our company. Mm-hmm. So get to be heavily involved in that management aspect when we're on site doing photo shoots. Um, And then we can get into this more later or now, but we're opening up our own commercial photography and videography studio here in Ogden. So we'll be heavily involved in the management of that. Um, Did you name it yet? I think it's Kelly McLeod and Friend. (laughs) (laughs) Inc. Ink. Sorry, thank you for clarifying that. We have Kelly it. Ink. Kelly Ink. Kelly Ink, I like it. Not to be confused with Kelly Services. Oh. No, totally different. Oh. Yeah. Use them too. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. No, we haven't named it yet. We've got a few okay. ideas, but um, we're open to suggestions. Yeah. Follow Cam? Oh. Follow Cam. <laughs> Cam. Cam Vibe? Patent pending. Or yeah. not patent. What is that? Uh, trademark. Trademark. Yeah. Peak. Yeah. Peak Cam. Camp. Camp. Camp, Camp Studios. <laughs> Camp Cam Studios. How big is the space? Uh, it's The floor space is 1,300 square feet, and then we'll have a, a built loft or mezzanine that'll give us another... 200 and some square feet? Yeah, so we'll have office space in this, or loft slash storage space up there, and then so the functional floor space is about, for studio work, is, uh, let's see, probably about 1,000 square feet. Are there, there are studios in town, right? You just wanted a place, one, that you can do work on, on your own there, but two, that you can rent out and maybe make money from? Is that? This is actually a good question. I was thinking about that too, because you have been looking or considering studio space for years, like for a long time. Yeah. And you've had small sort of office studio type things. Mm-hmm. And uh, there has been probably a few situations that were pretty close to maybe happening didn't happen like what's what was different about this situation in this location well so this kind of goes back to the first question which was you know how do you describe yourself as you know adventure photographer yeah um so like uh, there's a been always a strong desire to have a bit of a studio background and i do a lot of lighting and on location lighting in my work um not just within i think i'm most known for and recognized for the adventure space that i work in but um, I've also done a lot of editorial portraiture, um, location portraiture, um, things like that. So I have always wanted to have, um, access to a space where I can explore that more deeply and have the capacity to, you know, set up equipment, leave it set up, you know, experiment. So kind of like a, you know, a functional, uh, laboratory of sorts, uh, creative laboratory where I can just flex the creative muscles and use lighting in a way that um, I don't necessarily like get to in a controlled setting because I'm working outside and, you know, work on techniques um, that I can then bring on location. When it's like a gym. <clears throat> Photography, you need to work out, work right. things out. Exactly. Um, so 
to your question, Todd, about are there studio spaces there? Um, there are some natural lit, um, studio spaces, I believe in Ogden. Um, and there was a studio space that had more commercial capabilities. And by that, I mean something that has a large enough floor area, um, to do something more than just small product and, um, um, tall enough ceilings to set up lighting equipment and grip equipment and just bring in these tools that um, expand the creative possibilities than just shooting natural light. So not to knock any um, other studios, but there's a lot that facilitate more um, of just your sort of wedding and baby oh, we need uh, those and too. family yeah. uh, uh, photographers and those workflows. And those are great. But as far as like wanting to do commercial work and editorial work, we're, you know, you want to introduce lighting, you want to control lighting. Um, there just wasn't much available. With the exception, there was Ultraviolet Studios, which was here for a, a short, fairly short period of time, and they had a great space. It was huge. You could um, pull the van in there, and that's what I look for in a studio. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was massive, and we actually, when they transitioned outside of that, out of that space, we looked at um, renting that, taking over their lease, um, but it was sort of outside of our... Um, what we could afford mm -hmm. to to just rent. So that was sort of the um, the beginning, maybe not the beginning, but it was the true, like, okay, let's look for something that we can buy, purchase, if, and if that's available. And we really started to look more seriously because of what the rent was going to cost us and to take over that space. And it just didn't seem all that feasible for us to do, to just have a place that we could experiment. So we that began our journey of like, okay, really committed and looking towards a space that we could find and program for ourselves. But then yes, also possibly rent out to other photographers, um, or videographers that need access to these sorts of tools and spaces. So but, how, how much of that is in town in Ogden, little, little old Ogden, how, how many people need a space like that and I, you could rent to? I have no idea right now. I mean, we've, we've sort of, of put business, out feelers. That's part of your business plan, right? Well, the business plan was never to rely on that as a, okay. a revenue stream. Um, it will be something that, because right now it's a chicken and egg scenario where we don't really have a workflow that, um, or a client list that demands a mm. studio space. And it's hard to attract that sort of work unless you're creating that kind of work. And so mm. unless you have access to that, um, you know, how do you... That's sort of like podcasting and producing right. podcasts. Yeah. yeah, how do you how do you become a podcaster? It's easier to podcasting? get people into the studio than in the basement or your mom's basement. Totally. Or whatever. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah, I get that. I get that. Yeah. So yeah, the, the, um, the approach was never to rely on rental, renting a studio space. So we're not managing a studio that is for rent. We are managing a studio that will be available for rent when we're not using it. Gotcha. Um, but it, principally it is our studio. Yeah. Um, but knowing that there will be assets that we're going to invest in like, um, a cyclorama wall or a, a infinity wall, a um, vending machine, a vending obviously. machine, a popcorn machine, <laughs> You're gonna need um, a popcorn machine for sure. but there will be certain things that we have to invest in that, uh, when we're not using them, they're just sitting there idly and they're costing us money. And if, if there are other people in the community at a, um, an affordable rate that we can now then provide opportunities for other photographers to expand their, um, basically go to the gym and, you know, flex their creative muscles, then great. Like we want to, that's part of our, that's part of our mission. It's not really a mission of camera cloud photography. Um, but it is a part of our mission in our involvement in the arts is to sort of facilitate and help grow, um, give opportunity to other artists in the community. So that sort of s filters back into what Kelly's doing with Oka and, um, you know, another project we've been working on that I'm sure we're going to talk about later, which is Salty Magazine. Um, so a lot of this stuff, it feels very chaotic and, and scattered, but really it's all, it all. Do you have a master back. plan? Let's talk about your master plan because here's what, here's what people want to know. Yeah. What's this? You're a professional professional photographer and you don't have 90,000 followers on Instagram and you right. don't make a, a living off of YouTube. So how in the heck, you know, doing like, I just tried this lens, but this is the best camera for what you need. But so how do you make a living not doing those two things in 2022? 
actually uh, being a photographer. Right. Yeah. We, yeah, that's pretty much it. We, <laughs> we focus on uh, providing um, client work and we focus on the client and what the client needs. So it's not really about. How did, but, so I guess the question is, I guess you don't need that stuff to get a client. In other words, um, no, it's helpful for sure. But if I've always thought that, you know, Instagram, you know, any of these social channels are great for getting your work out there and getting noticed. But if you're relying on it as your revenue stream, I think that that's like wanting to be um, a professional athlete, you know, in the NBA. Like there's just so few people who can uh, garner that much following and uh, develop a reputation or a I guess really more of a following than a reputation, but that's that, not it, everybody can give 110. percent I mean, You got to give 110 percent. Be a professional athlete. Not, I know that. I thought you were talking about social media. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. I did too. I was like, yeah, like the yeah, the you know the Kardashians are just applies like the board. 110. Well, there's the a time. famous um, collegiate athlete who's a who's a girl who just got called out by a, a famous uh, women's athlete because of the way she is earning millions a year as an LSU or something gymnast through social media. You know, she might, I mean, gymnastics is one of those sports that you, unless you're on the Olympic team, I don't necessarily know how you make a living at that. But at the same time, she took advantage of social media to make a living right. through through that. Yeah, By taking advantage, leveraged it, like Lever saw an opportunity yeah, yeah. and, and I think that's where you should really identify the difference between what is an influencer and what is a creative. And I don't think that those th they can be the same, but they're not always. And I think most people who are doing, you know, high level creative work, they're focused on the work and maybe they can they may generate a large following because of that. But like if you're busy working all the time, like it's really hard to focus on being an influencer at the same time. Like. Being an influencer is an, a full-time self in and of itself. But that's not what you are. No, you're not, not an influencer. I don't. I don't hope not. <laughs> you, you well, and you use your Instagram as a portfolio, right. and I peeped it today, and I went all the way to the beginning, which had some photos of of you, Kelly, and um, I I, I saw some trends, we did some things. And Has then, the word gotten you think better or worse since that? Yeah, there's some good stuff in the beginning. Let's just say that. <laughs> um, but what's great? What's, he just said you're petering out. Is what he said. <laughs> I think that you hit peak came him a long time ago. Oh, definitely. If you look at the Instagram, he's done for right now. And that's what's crazy is that you look at like. I mean, there were some sections there in the middle where you could tell the algorithm was working in your favor for Instagram. Yep. You got all these likes and stuff, and now you post and it. I, it just it's just sad because that started as I was I've been pissed at Instagram for 10 years but because um, there's it's zero rep representation of how good the work is yeah. like zero because there's phenomenal photos that have been posted recently that get like a hundred likes or yeah. something it's crazy yeah I yeah it, it is unfortunate and it's discouraging because uh, so I go in waves of sharing work and you know, there was a period of time when the algorithm seemed to be working and I was doing things correct. Like I was trying to post every day and follow that that sort of suggested path. Um, and it worked. And then it, but then I don't know, I fell off and then I started to reengage and then the the engagement fell or dropped. And, and that was discouraging. And then it's like, well, why am I doing this? Who are we talking to? And I have to constantly remind myself that, uh, you know, the reason we're doing this is to talk to it ultimately brands ad agencies art directors art buyers that is our that's who we are and editors like that's who we are trying to market ourselves towards so if i get you know three people in that category <coughs> to pay attention to anything we're posting um versus a thousand just clicks or likes like that's a that is a measurable win to have three people that could potentially hire us engage at all in the work that we're sharing. So yeah, trying to sort of maintain that uh, perspective is important um, for the for our mental health, because otherwise it's like, why, who are we talking to? Like, yeah. Oh, it's gotta be frustrating. Cause yeah, it's, it's hard because you work really hard to have this stuff, but that's also the limitation of, it's the frustrating thing of like magazines uh, slowly going away because there's not a great outlet for a lot of work. 
Um, so it's how do you share work and how do you get that satisfaction? So that's another reason, um, you know, we want to have the studio and flex those creative muscles a bit more and maybe even have our own gallery within the space or be able to have people come there and see it. And when we have work we want to share, um, you know, really trying to explore other ways of engaging, not just with the community, but also just with the work itself. Because if you're just relying on, for me anyways, if I'm just relying on Instagram or any social platform to engage with people about the work we're creating, like quickly, I'm just like, oh, well, I don't really care anymore. Um, and I'll still be creating work, but there's just that missing component, which is sharing work. And um, it can be pretty frustrating. Kelly, give, give me an argument why you should be the adventure guest on this podcast. <laughs> um, let's see. I'd rather be skiing right now. Oh. At, at night? <laughs> No, yeah. he been, Night skiing. She means been talking to us. <laughs> no, 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 no. Skiing, walking <laughs> down the street, having dinner. Yeah. No. Um, it's, I, it's in your blood for sure. It is. Well, and I think the interesting thing about Instagram too, or any social media platform, is it's really easy to get caught up in the current trends versus kind of staying true to your own creative thoughts and ideas and so, you know, not looking and seeing what everybody else is doing and how to do the same thing yourself. Like, how can you make what you want that, you know, really holds true to your own creative outlook? Because it won't be rewarding at times no. on the socials. And, like, if you can just recreate what everybody else does, then where is there any creativity in that? So I just think it's interesting. Instagram and all those social media platforms are just pretty interesting platforms. So, so Cam cut his teeth working with... Like, uh, vendors, you know, uh, are you, is that your job now to sort of create those deals for them? I mean, I'm trying to help with that. Sales or marketing is not my strong suit, more mm. project management okay. or managing a team, kind of setting up the logistics when there are big photo shoots is definitely more my strong suit. Is So Cam's one person. Yeah. But does he sometimes act like three? Like you said, managing a team. So yeah, I mean, we I, the personalities. Yeah. I'm a Gemini. Yeah. <laughs> Same. Yeah. <laughs> I have good days and bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the the creative, you know, uh, in, individuals in Ogden have grown and we've been able to bring some of them on for oh, certain oh. jobs. So we've been able to add videography to a lot of what we can offer to client work. And there's a couple of local videographers who have been really helpful to expand those skill sets and trying to use them as part of the team when we have work obviously has been really great there's a period of time where we actually really considered moving to salt lake city or mm -hmm. um or out of utah altogether um to grow this business um but stubbornly you know we we love ogden and we our roots are here now so um we really I, well i more so than kelly um, really just dug my heels in and was like, okay, well, I want to like build, I don't want to have to go to Salt Lake for the talent. Like, I don't want to have to go there to, um, I don't want to have to depend on Salt Lake for talent. I'm assuming um, the internet makes that possible. Um, like you can share your work and email and just tell people, uh, yeah, I'm based out of Ogden, not Salt Lake. Or do you have to be in a big city to meet the people, to do the social thing, to get the clients? Well, I'm talking about more like the team. So like Kelly was saying, okay. the, 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 collaborators that we can work with to get um, larger contracts. So like outside of a single photo job, like if, so if I'm looking for assistance, camera assistance, uh, video work, grip work, you know, any anything that helps us perform at a higher level and give us more production value, um, stubbornly, we wanted to sort of develop that talent or at least uh, try to help develop that talent here locally. So that's still a part of our mission and oh, that's goal, huge. Um, so that we don't have to go. And that was part of, you know, opening the studio is, you know, I don't want to have to take all of my equipment, go down to Salt Lake City um, and and work there. Um, I think we have talented people here and we're close enough to Salt Lake City. Clients should be able to hire us um, just like they would hire anybody in, in Salt Lake. So um, that's where, you know, Kelly also, I guess, I don't know that that goes back to what your role is or sort of is growing into be, which is managing um, these other subcontractors, I guess, or, mm -hmm. you know, aspects of our team to help us grow. 
And it's just great to keep the local creatives here so they don't move to Salt Lake. I mean, Ogden Oh, I love awesome. it. I love it. So, I also yeah. love the fact that I can imagine Cam saying, I'm the talent, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm be, the talent. I'll be in my trailer. <laughs> that could be a good name for the new business. Bring well. me the trailer. I love it. <laughs> Okay, so Cam, do you, I don't know if you mind mentioning any clients. I just wanted, for those <clears throat> photographers who are young and ambitious and stuff, um, and they probably see the success on Instagram and YouTube and want to lean that direction, but what's the advantage of, of working professionally with, um, I don't know what you call them, ad agencies or clients like that, like that, going that direction and maybe putting, I don't know, backseat, to to socials but well the direction you went in other words I think advantage the reward is working with other people and helping to understand other people's needs and help solve their problems i mean that's really what the business that's the business we're in what is what is your problem how can we help solve it uh through um imagery that's what that's what our job is and you know you don't get that you don't get that opportunity when you're just creating work for yourself sharing it on social media and hoping that you get likes or followers or whatever you're sort of just creating your own work which is important and that's valuable but i think what people need to understand is what we do is a lot more uh involved than just taking photos in fact a lot of times taking the photo is the last thing we get to do it's almost um, the easiest part in a way and it is a lot of the times the <laughs> yeah. easiest part and it's it's not the you know if we had to put percentages to the work you know that's a small percentage of what we end up doing there's a lot of pre-production there's a lot of conversations back and forth understanding creative briefs there's a lot of time that you don't even get to bill for like reaching out to clients and at marketing yourself and just trying to get your foot in the door places. So you you just uh, knew all this stuff. You were born knowing all this stuff, right? Yeah, and you've made no mistakes, right? Like <laughs> Never. Just from the beginning, you knew exactly what. Did you take you a, a, a Udemy course, no. uh, a YouTube? <laughs> like, how did you learn all this? That's a great question. I um, mean, I used to come home from my long commute to Salt Lake, and when Cam first, you know, quit his full time job to do this full time. Uh, I would come home and he'd be sitting on the couch and it would just look like, you know, disheveled mess. Still in my I pajamas. Yeah. yeah like just I feel that, man. Sitting at yeah. his computer, learning, reading everything he could possibly consume on the internet. Cam, what did you do before? Yeah. I worked in healthcare. Oh, you um, both did? Yep. Okay. I was on, um, so Kelly and I started our healthcare careers at General Motors in Michigan. Um, and we, as were, most people do, we, <laughs> we were contracted to do wellness programs for General Motors. Okay. Okay. So we were on site wellness coordinators. And then when we moved out here, um, part of the reason to do that was we were obviously interested in a place that offered a great outdoor lifestyle and affordability. But, um, most importantly, we were interested in grad school, uh, programs that the U had. So I was interested in PA school. Kelly was looking at a, um, uh, accelerated nursing programs. Um, so I showed up here and just started that journey and ended up working as a ski patroller. So kind of getting some first aid um, experience there. And then um, I was working at my first job at uh, Ogden Regional was in the blood bank. It was just drawing blood. And then I got a job in their cardiac rehab um, department and doing a lot of inpatient um, cardiac rehab. Um, so I would um, go to patients' rooms and walk these patients after um, open heart surgeries. And you miss that? Uh, no, not really. I don't. I mean, it, what there was, I actually really liked that job. Um, but no, I, I don't miss doing that work at all. Um, and then I ended up going to the U and worked in the pulmonary department, doing uh, pulmonary function testing, and all the while trying to get as much experience as possible so I could apply to PA school and. Mm. And that whole thing. Um, but while doing that, I was shooting photos and um, trying to figure that out, knowing that kind of in the back of my mind, I wanted to do that professionally. But getting to your question, um, like I never had anybody who modeled that. I didn't know what a professional photographer looked like. I didn't know what the path was to do that. I and knew this, this was six, seven, eight, ten years. Ago. How long ago was this? Um, this was ten years ago. Yeah, ten years ago. Which yeah, well, ten years ago is when I quit. Yeah. So true. you know, leading up to that. It was more than 
The reason I ask is because right now you can go on YouTube and might maybe find some of those answers. But but yeah. 10 years ago, right. that was not an option, right? No, there was very little. You had to like be pretty clever and kind of have a... Yeah, it's funny I say that because I don't know how I discovered this. But like I had to follow and do a lot of research and I just like scoured the internet for other people's websites. Like that was the mm -hmm. best way to do it. YouTube wasn't a great resource. Um, so I just spent a lot of time, you know, reading blogs. Blogs were uh, mm -hmm. quite popular at that point. Um, and just trying do, to... Do you remember any of those or a, or a photographer that like you learned a lot from back then? Um <clears throat> There was a photographer, Joey L, that I followed and still follow his work. Um, he was a, um, a portrait photographer um, out of Brooklyn, New York area. Um, his work, I, I was always a big fan of his work. A lot of um, yeah, lit portraiture, environmental portraiture. Um, so he was a big resource that I read up a lot on and learned about, a lot about equipment because he had a lot of blogs about the equipment he was using and especially trying to understand off-camera flash and mm -hmm. that. Um, there was Chase Jarvis. Um, which oh, I know I, that name. Yeah, yeah, Chase Jarvis was, I think around that time, he was just starting his creative live. Um, so there were some resources from him that you could sort of learn. Classes and, you could take. Yeah, and I was like, or he did like live webinars. So there'd yeah. be like this six hour, you know, live yeah. webinar or something like that. And, um, or at least that's what it felt like. But I'd spend, what felt like all day just listening to this live webinar about like business and photography. Um, so I really tried to focus on a lot of that stuff because I, I, I felt pretty strong about my, I don't know, my, my sensibility in photography. Like I knew what I was kind of looking for and looking to accomplish. So early on, I focused on any resources I could find to figure out more technical stuff to, to execute my vision more clearly and business. I wanted to understand like how do you run a photo business how do you learn you know contract negotiations billing um what should a contract look like what are the what are the makings of that how do you license photos and this was all pre social media so that was like that's been a whole another journey of like how to understand the business workings of of that sort of license licensing imagery through that but um yeah so i was just Self-taught, really. And it, I tried hard to find mentors, actually. How, how did you, being self-taught, how did you um, have the confidence then to apply for some of those or try to get some of those photography jobs in the beginning where, you know, your full-time job was not that? My, f I had a good, I had a really great opportunity. So a friend of mine was working at Cool Clothing, so the outdoor clothing company. KUHL. KUHL. Um, and he, he was the, I don't know what his job was at the time. I think he was in sales still. Yeah. And, and cause he was working with, uh, retailers. So a lot of the retailers needed specific imagery, um, that maybe they didn't have. And so, uh, like in their and library, a Utah brand, right? Yep. They're out of Salt Lake. And this friend of mine, uh, lived here. Very good, dear friend of mine still is to this day. And he came to me when I was working at the hospital and was like, hey, you know, like you're shooting this kind of stuff. Do you have any photos like this that we could buy? And so this was this is what would be called spec work. So I had or just like spec licensing where I had a library of imagery and a, a, a commercial client or an apparel brand in this case wanted to license that photo for use. And so that's kind of I started. And I think I, the first photo I sold was like three hundred dollars. And I was like, Oh wow! Like, this <laughs> yeah. is great. Yeah. Um, if I just had more time to was create it, a bigger library, was it a vest? Was it socks? <laughs> I think it was just that? a landscape. It was like people hiking. Like it, they didn't even have their in their cool in underwear. In their cool yeah. underwear. <laughs> um, it was just a generic photo, I think, at the time. And but then that led me to say, like, well, hey, if you just give me some of your clothes, I could take, I could be doing what I'm doing, and I guess so. That's really more. Oh, well, the light bulb went off. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's more spec work. So then I was like, okay, well, just give me some stuff and I'll go with some friends and we'll take these photos. And and so I started doing that and sold another photo or sold three photos. And I was like, oh, okay, well, there's, you know, $900. Like, oh, wow, I can buy a new lens maybe, or I can do this. Um, and, you know, always kind of like reinvesting in either myself or the business. Um, Kelly, when did you know that this was gonna, he was gonna eventually go full-time as a photographer? Ooh, 
when did I know? I know. When? Do you, well, I'll let you answer. I mean, I or think... Or try to answer. I feel like it was right... Um, it was when he got his second uh, re- rejection from the University of Utah in their PA program, and he was asked to... <laughs> at the time, I don't know if they're still doing this, but at the time, you could only apply three times, and then you could not apply any longer. In a row. Todd, you got a brother that knows something about that, right? Yeah. I was rejected twice, I think, for my... Oh, you were? Brother. Okay. Corey was like three times, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so he decided, so he, and then he was told at the second rejection that he needed to change his resume and do something different. And They so did not, they say that? Well, I, so I went back and looked for feedback and wanted to know like, hey, where, where am I falling short here? What can I do? Sure. Knowing that like, okay, I was working full time. So I had a 40 hour a week job that I was commuting to Salt Lake City for via the train. So that added two hours to my day every day. Of, one way. One way. So. So an eight hour day was a 12 hour day of, of commuting. On top of that, there was one day a week that we were, that Kelly would drive and then pick me up and then we would go up to the People's Health Clinic in Park City and volunteer there mm-hmm. and then come back. And then on the weekends, I was working as a part-time uh, or a volunteer ski patroller. Um, I did both capacities. Um, but so like I had, I was spread so thin um, and so I was asking for feedback, like, hey, where, you know, what can I possibly do? How, how could I make myself as a stronger candidate? Um, and I think they said, you need to find new experiences within your current experiences and something to the effect of uh, you need to try to be the best version of yourself. It sounded like a <laughs> what the uh, some Dr. <laughs> Seuss riddle or something. Yeah, I was yeah, just like, yeah. Like, I do that every day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I don't and know. I was just so notes? yeah. I was so jaded and oh, boy. just how much. Also, so how many years was that into a profession that you no longer have anything and money and time? I don't know. Five, I mean, it was five years maybe yeah, of. I mean, besides of that time undergrad, frame, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I, I there was really nothing left. I was kind of at this ceiling of of potential, unless I just wanted to try to find an entire new job within healthcare. Um, There was no real way for me to get new experiences. Um, And so I was just sort of reading between the lines and thought to myself, well, okay, there's there's, you know, 40 seats in this program or something like that. Like, I'm not competing for um, 40 seats. I'm competing for like uh, maybe three. Yeah. I'm in competition for three seats. Like I you could sort of see there was this systematic effort to build a diverse program and like in that effort to make a diverse program, you on merit are not competing for one of 40 seats. You're competing for a selection that they, that you sort of fit their model. And I was just like, okay, this is not even fully a merit. The curtain had been pulled back a little bit for me. And I just realized, okay, well, I can always, at least you had some options. Yeah. Well, and I just knew I could always come back to that. Okay. So, um, this was not something that I needed to slam the door on, but I was prepared to just try something different. So Kelly and I, I remember, yeah, we had a conversation before I even, I think it was, I'd have to look back at the timeline. Did we get married before that happened? Do you remember? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think it was while we were getting married, um, like we were back in Michigan and we had a sort of a heart to heart. And I said, if I don't get um, accepted, then I'm going to pivot and try something else. So I found out like November, I think. Um, That's a great podcast, by the way. You ever watch the Pivot podcast? No. No. Okay. okay. Earmark that. Yeah. <laughs> Earmark. Um, so we, yeah, I don't know. We had that talk, and then that was November when I found out I didn't get in. And then in uh, December, I put in my notice, and January 1st, 2013, I, I left the hospital. And then, real quick, because we could chat. This is going to be two hours if we don't <laughs> wrap this up. How, how long did it take? to become do you have savings like how long did it take to become a professional photographer it was like a week like three weeks um super fast it was like yeah over it was a week just end? under a month nice job no <laughs> um is this a record did you tell somebody <laughs> Can we, yeah Guinness book kelly record. and i have always been planners yeah and we were prepared to take that risk financially and she had her job so she but we've always been very very uh, steadfast in keeping our overhead as low as possible. That is just something we've always done. Rent, um, when we bought a house, we bought as cheap of a house as we could 
you know, afford, get yeah. afford. We paid that house off, you know, like as fast as we could. You know, we, we've always been very diligent at keeping our overhead low because knowing that the more we could do that, the more opportunities we could open for ourselves. So we had time um, for me to take this endeavor. It, it actually, I had some pretty immediate success that helped. So I remember very quickly, so I quit in January. That month, I was up at Snow Basin, and um, now something else to remember is we, living in Ogden, there's a lot of outdoor businesses here. We happen to have friends who were involved in a lot of those outdoor businesses, whether it's Atomic or Solomon or Rosignol, Sunto. Um, so we kind of had some social access to that uh, part of my career path um, that maybe others wouldn't have directly. Um, and those were just coincidental relationships that we had. Um, and I leveraged those as much as I could. So letting people know like, hey, this is what I'm doing, you know, any opportunities you have. And I had friends and people around me that believed in me, I guess. I don't know why. No. I had no proof. Well, you sold three prints or something. Like right. it did sell a few things. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there was the work wasn't bad. It wasn't great, but it wasn't it was it was good enough for people to continue to give us our sort of open doors for us. So anyways, I was introduced at Snow Basin uh, to a local um, or a, a recent transplant, Derek Taylor, who was the mm. um, editor at large yeah. for Powder Magazine. And he was here um and he sort of told me shared with me that he was writing a story about uh ogden and snow basin or really all the ski areas but really it was a story about ogden and it being a next ski town or something so wait you don't have to golf to no. meet people and no make make relationship you business the, relationships you can go to the cinnabar lounge at snow basin, apparently. <laughs> i like this part. um so yeah in that moment i shared with him that oh i'm a photographer do you need any help with this project? You know, Powder Magazine, this is great. Like I would, this is a dream of mine. Um, and he said, no, um, I, I don't need any help Ooh. with this. Uh, <laughs> I've got photographers who are coming up from Salt Lake City, you know, the likes of Lee Cohen and some of these legends who, you know, I was well aware of and, you know, aspired to be. And, yeah. um, <laughs> and he was like, but you know, maybe I could use, I could use some photos of like town. They're not gonna shoot that stuff. So I just said, I. I'm, I'm going to give you the best damn town pictures yeah, you've ever he, seen. He yeah. kind of opened the door just enough. And yeah. I, that evening went out and I got home and I went out and I took all these like, so at the time there was still a lot, this was 2013. So there were still a lot of boarded up buildings downtown. So I went and took these, like set my camera up on a tripod. I even walked in front of them to just like give some sort of human element to these barren, uh, urban landscapes. And, um, but that's it. That's it. Because, if you were lazy, you wouldn't have gone that extra yeah. step to think about that, and you would have just boring shot. Yep. And, and you did one thing to set those photos apart. But that is one little Easter egg a lot of people don't know, is that you are actually in every photo that you take. <laughs> you <just> have, <laughs> but sometimes you just have to really look. Like it's, sometimes it's not super clear, but if you... It's like a Where's Waldo. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> If only knew we knew that 10 years oh, ago. That's so funny. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm going to start looking now. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. So I sent those into Derek, and, and he was like, oh. Um, sort of like, oh, this is, one, he took the initiative, I think, and two, these are better than I expected. And so he yeah. passed me on to the photo editor, who's um, you know an absolute legend, this guy Dave Reddick, who um, is the scariest and most handsome man simultaneously that you'll kind of dreamy. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so then I get it like, I, I can't remember if it was a text message or an email and to set up a phone call. And then like, I remember I was, I still actually, when I left the hospital, I kept my foot in the door there as a backup plan. Yeah. I had a fail safe. So I was on, on call, a PRN uh, employee and I was on my way to go work one day. So I was riding the train and I get this scheduled phone call with the photo editor of Potter magazine. And he's like, you know, we just had this whole conversation about, like, yeah, these photos are great, but like, you know, he gave me some advice and, mm. um, you know, like, just keep getting out there and shooting. He, and I remember him saying, like, oh, hey, sorry, I'm sure you're out in the field today. And I was like, uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 
yeah, busy photographer here. Oh like, God. don't have much Did time. Did he say that on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, the light's getting good, Dave. Like, I'm going to have to go. <laughs> <laughs> and I just was like, you know, a bit of you know, imp- re- imposter syndrome for sure. Like, I was just like, well, yeah, you know, I'm having this conversation with this guy who, you know, yeah, yeah I would love to be in, considered a part of this, but I I didn't think of myself in that way. I remember all. sending, they they made us at Weber State in the uh, English department, you had to send articles to your favorite magazine or book or to try to maybe get published or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I sent one to Rock and Ice and I got the rejection letter. Is it, is it I think I want to say it was Andrew, is it McLean? McLean, does that sound Yeah, that sounds, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and I was yeah. both devastated and stoked at the same time because it was the rejection letter signed by him. I'm, mm-hmm. But wait, now we're bros. <laughs> I got, I got it. So you're saying there's a chance. Seriously, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> yeah, but you got to go through those. You got to go through those steps a little bit sometimes. Yeah. Well, so. and you always learn. I mean, it sounds so silly, but you always learn something from failure or rejection. Yeah. Like, oh, okay, that didn't work. So next time, I'm going to try this. Yeah. I mean, and the thing about Cam is he's such a hard worker. And literally will deliver the best he can every time. Like even if it's maybe a small job that doesn't have like great passion for him, he'll still deliver the best quality product that he well, can. Two things stand out about that story. He went out that night. Mm-hmm. A lot of people could have went like, I'm tired. Yep. Lighting's not it's dark, you know, whatever. And then when he when you take the photos, it's how can I make it stand out? Yep. 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 And that I'd- was you walking across the frame fully nude. <laughs> That's all it took. It was a good choice. You've studied that photo. <laughs> Todd, let's talk about Salty. What are you doing? All right, so to introduce this project, I'm going to read what we have spent a lot of time probably in the process of writing. Where's just the mission statement? Yeah, full disclosure, that, that should be like revamped. Don't oh, already? The mission? Where's just the I haven't even read it yet. This isn't just the mission right here. <laughs> Where Kelly might have it on her phone. Yeah, know, you got it on your phone. Yeah, pull up just the, the mission. Well, the wait, wait, while you're doing that, tell us how are all three of you involved? Like, give us a little bit of background here. I think you were even involved at one point. I'm supposed to be. It's my dream, but you stole it. <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> wow, it hurts right here. Salty Magazine. So Salty Magazine is. I a, feel salty right now. That's a, what. It's a. It's sort of a passion project. Um, Community based. Um, it's a. It's an effort to um, originally this this idea sort of manifested. Oh man, how this was pre-COVID yeah. conversations oh, yeah. and planning. So this was really out of the identification that Ogden was going through a transition, um, and that part of that transition was this increase effort to grow. Um, the arts side of its community and its um, offerings. Um, For quick history, because uh, it was a purposeful decision by the marketers that be uh, in this town and um, our friends, essentially, Mm -hmm. to, and it makes sense, to to market Ogden as an adventure town. And then, and it was very successful for quite some time. And there was zero arts marketing and so this is something that you noticed the arts yeah it seemed that that, up and coming well and even more importantly there was this crossover between arts and adventure and i was seeing this you know this was very obvious in a lot of other towns where um where adventure was part of the fabric of the culture but so was so was culture and arts and those two things were so interlinked um you know craftspeople and you know and it happens a lot in towns that are um you know tourism towns like Mm. people have to find other ways of creating revenue for themselves and so you know arts and crafts and things like that are a part of that where people can make it telling todd we should start a podcast about that (laughs) well let's spitball it today after the show we'll talk about it so that was the idea was how can we sort of help promote but also archive the transition and that was a big part of what we wanted to do that was part of the the mission of what we were going to do which was archive this transition so that in 20 years when ogden is this booming arts and adventure mecca um that somewhere people could point to like remember when and not just like 
orally, but actually look at um, some sort of visual documentation and written documentation of what was going on. Um, is it still the idea? Because you we're, were speaking a little past tense there, so. Yeah, that's still at the heart of the project for okay. sure, and okay. that the project has evolved. Um, and the over goal time. was always, and continues to always be, to archive these stories in a in a luscious. Uh, print piece, yeah. right? Because because yeah. uh, there are many of us that still, you know, ha love that feel, right? Of a, of a nice, beautiful, archived magazine that you save forever, right? Mm -hmm. It becomes kind of part of your identity, even as much as just a coffee table book. You want you want the full set of whatever that might be, right? Um, and so, I think that that's probably what <clears throat> excuse me identified it as much as anything in the beginning was that. Mm -hmm passion towards the print piece mm -hmm. in a time where you know magazines were folding and so it was sort yep. of a, a mix of how do you make that happen right? yeah yep and so that becomes you know that was definitely the original mission of things and it hasn't changed but also life has been strange the last you know several years mm -hmm. and just the natural evolution of asking that question what do you do to create a magazine in 2020 we're now 2022, right? It isn't the same as it was. But we right. are making a print magazine, which is Is great. it is it yeah. have you doubled down? Is it something where it's like you have more confidence that something like this is needed or, or are you wait like where are you, where are you getting at here, Todd? Well, I I'm, I'm getting at the, you know, the the print piece is happening. I think that if we were to look at that original conversation years ago to now, you would see conversations that lulled for quite some time. Right, because of life and and quarantine and all these things, right? But then we literally gave our money back. Yeah, we so we, we had did. we did get some initial oh, wow. funding. Well, it's the same funding we're operating on right now. But um, when it was a conscious choice it, too. Now's not that time. Right, we we were trying to get this project off the ground and had received funding to do so, and then the pandemic hit, and we consciously said it would be irresponsible for us to not knowing what the feasibility of pulling something like off this like like this off is especially within the time frame that was um attached to the funding we said no we need to give this back um so at that point there was a period of time where i just thought this project was completely dead in the water um and then we applied for funding again and they gave us more <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah, and and just like a certain podcasting uh, partnership, you know, over the course of many many years, you know, we we did have mm -hmm. two people in this case, three people, and then the numbers have sort of added that would still meet semi regularly, right? Mm -hmm. And so even when things weren't happening, maybe at at a pace or scale that we originally had thought, there was still that passion in those conversations that happened, right? And so. That's why even looking back at, at Brandon, like at our story, like it's, it is kind of incredible that we're still doing this after 12 years, but it's because of the two of us. I'm still just confident yep. that that's what it was, right? And so I think that that's why this project is a big part of what it was, even through all of that and the times where I was maybe curious, you know, whether or not it would move forward or not. Um, there was still that passion in those conversations. And let's be honest, you know, it was a, it was a way for us to keep in touch too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I mean, what what better reason to come up with a project that you're passionate about is that it, you know it's it assigns times to yep. meet up and hang out with your favorite people. And maybe you, I'm naive about it, but it like has been really great to expand my social outlet with hmm. other local creatives. I just never that thought never really crossed my mind, but there's some. Of course, really great people in Ogden. Do you have the uh, oh, mission yeah. statement pulled up? Why don't you read that and then... So our mission is to bring compelling stories to life through thoughtful artistic presentation that celebrates our unique communities' qualities while providing a platform that, list, that lifts our local creatives and honors our adventurous ethos. <laughs> there it is. Thank you. There it is. <laughs> In ours, it's like a little clapping emoji, but it's the same. <laughs> same that was great. So <laughs> when, you know, Kelly reads that and what's absent there is this idea of archiving. And, you know, that's still kind of at the, the root of what we're trying to do. 
but really it's turned into more um, a mission to provide opportunity to um, to artists and creatives and um, provide a platform for people to create work about their community and share it with paid opportunity. Um, and with that also provide um, mentorship and feedback. Um, because I think in the absence of editor, I think the worst thing to happen to magazines is the loss of the editor. Because the editor was this, it, although it could be argued there was a lot of gatekeeping and things that went along with that, um, you also, like, with that potential negative, the positive of having someone there to challenge you, push you, provide you feedback in the work that you're creating, like, that is the one thing that is so absent from social media and do, do they not have they have editors right now or what what do you mean by that well just the, you know the, the fewer options the fewer opportunities to submit to publications because mm. publications are on the decline and gotcha. they will yeah. continue to do that and you're There's, right that interaction with editors too yeah and then the, what, the what's replacing that is social media as mm. most people's outlet self-curated content to uh, an audience that is algorithmic based does not provide you the opportunity to get feedback to improve. No, but we are so trying to figure out what the algorithm is telling us right. all the time. And it's not telling you anything yeah. except that it's occupying more of yours or someone else's attention. Like that's what the algorithm is designed to do to grab your attention and keep you engaged. It's not meant to make you better. So are part and of to the, make you feel <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like bad bats. about yourself, <laughs> which is only half of it. I think yeah. that back in the day, probably the best editors make you, they inspire you and make you feel shitty. Like it's just that right mix of both. And I think the social media just makes you feel probably shitty. Yeah. Like it's mostly just that side of things. Right? More, yeah. Well, you don't have the specific feedback because like yeah. you said, Cam, at least an editor, editor would tell you what you need, how, how to improve. Yeah, like that I, I've never seen so a, I've never seen a quality peer review through social media, not really. Um, but I mean, co Todd, coming from you the, clearly haven't read through the comments. Right? <laughs> like when you really <laughs> get trolls. to the good stuff, yeah. uh, coming from a you know a, um, an educational background and advising, um, I'm sure you you know like you get that exposure at the college level. But what happens, you know, unless you're having jobs, you know, that's the other thing. Like if you're if you're just like a creative who's freelancer, yeah, freelancing, yeah. like I never get feed. I almost never get feedback. So, mm -hmm. like I'll have a client and I'll say like, hey, how? The last thing you want to do is go to your client and be like, hey, how could I have done better? If you want, you know, that's feedback, such a weird I thing. Talk to say. about you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I just probably need to include you in the room. Is basically what I need to do. But you make such a good point. That's so true. And so that's that's one opportunity that we've we've been able to have with the yep. team that we put together. And so, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Awesome. So can we expect a print version soon? So I mean, that's the hope. We're, we were hoping we're shooting for January, but I think that might be not doable. So maybe February, March. And this is annual, semi-annual? What are your thoughts? This is a one-time print piece right now. Yeah, until we can secure Oh, like a one and done? Well, it's a one and done because we're going to blow through our funding. So unless we oh. find... But um, this one could leverage... To, this could be the project, the culmination of the project. Yeah. There's, I think, I think the fact that there aren't those expectations necessarily is exciting. I mean, it's exciting for me, probably putting all that energy into it. Well, but if you build a team, I mean, you've collected so much great talent, it'd be a shame to see that dis this disperse. Is, this I is guess. our, this is my cynical call to action, which is, you know, we're going to do this and we're going to do it to the best of our ability with the money that we have. Once that's done, we have no more money. So unless the community and community partners see the value in that and want to continue to support it, we cannot. That's a tough ask. Don't you continue. have don't, don't you have to push that a little bit? I am pushing that right now. Right now? But it's, okay. it's just not in like a, you know, it's not a hoorah. Like it's sort of like it's a, it's the reality of the project. You know, we want, we see the value in it, but if the community doesn't see the value in it, if community partners don't see the value in it, then there is no, that, who else are we doing it for? Like, if, mm. if, if we're going to do it for just ourselves, then um, it's a lot of money to for produce like a, a high quality print yep. piece for just ourselves. 
Yeah, um, it takes a lot of time, talent, and resources, which all costs money. Yeah. But honestly, it does come back to what we were just talking about as far as the feedback goes. So the ultimate feedback will be mm-hmm. the community's impression of the work itself, right? And so I don't think that doesn't mean that that's all you get. It's more just like, right. all right, well, let's gauge the reaction. Let's mm-hmm. see if we could leverage an actual piece. There's so many visual people. Imagine just holding... Our inspiration, which I'm surprised you don't have it with you at all times, <laughs> is one issue of one amazing, <clears throat> excuse me, archival magazine. It just became like the Bible mm. for moving forward. And so theoretically, this salty piece kind of becomes that new version of that. And mm. so the inspiration of that alone, you know, could do really good things for somebody that might want to invest into that. So so it, it takes out what's the most you would want to do? If you got all the funding in the world. It'd probably be an annual or biannual. Yeah. And I think we would still continue to leverage the digital aspect because that's really the easiest uh, way to share stories, communicate with people on a... Uh, I mean, that's how we consume media. Yeah. And the print... So piece, there is a website if we didn't say. Yeah. yeah. Salty. Yep. Salty-mag.com. Yep. So the the... Digital aspect is like the best way to communicate, um, but the print piece will sort of be the um, the highlight, almost like a um, an anthology of the year's best. But we'll reserve some pieces, so it'll be like a I don't know what would you call that, like a a catalog of best hits with um, with new stories to share that will be archival quality. Um, the layout, it will give us more creative control over layout and design, which we're very excited about. Did you get the grid right yet? <laughs> wow, we have a guy who has the grid. Oh, I know. Got yeah. a guy with a grid. Yeah. Got a guy with a grid. You've probably had hours I've of I've had these conversations, conversations before, and they're amazing because the excitement level from that gentleman <laughs> oh, is fantastic. I love it. I yeah. love it. Well, yeah. and I think, you know, the great thing about our website, too, is it's allowed us to do stuff like podcasts on there. We mm-hmm. link podcasts when it fits with the stories. And... We can do videos, which obviously you can't do when you do print. So we've been able to sort of expand our team from that standpoint, which has been really nice. And uh, yeah, I'm sort of consciously make a, a multimedia experience mm-hmm. through, you know, like what, what might be a more traditional magazine. And that's the great thing about digital. Yeah, you have still photos, you have a video, and you have a podcast. And, and then, of course, the writer's written words. Well, there's no rules. You can do whatever you yeah. want, right? Yeah. We can do animation. We can do... Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's what, those. listen, I don't like the drink, but I love Red Bull because <laughs> they just do whatever the hell they, they combine. Yeah. They essentially, I, I think they essentially, besides the athletes involved made break dancing an Olympic sport. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. they cover that next to mountain biking, next to art, next to all the things like they they just don't, they just do whatever Yeah. yeah. and then, and, it, and it'll make it work. Yep. And it's a wild culture, but it's pretty cool to watch. So yeah. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Well, my, you can my, certainly see what's going on now with uh, with Salty through the website, which is Salty Dash Mag, uh, and Instagram, and Instagram. Yeah, we've been a little yeah. quiet on Instagram, but we hope to start that well, up. Well, we again. kind of put all of our focus into this print, the, into doing print, which has taken our attention away from content generation, so um, and storytelling. So we just haven't been. We have a few stories that are um, primed to be, to be released. Mm-hmm. Um, we are hoping to release those exclusively on, um, or at least um, at first look through the print and then post them on uh, the website. But it's looking now, like as the print piece kind of gets pushed back, we'll probably release those um, digitally first. But So real quick, just announce some of the talent working with you. I was referring to Andrew Prims yep. as a graphic designer. Uh, who are some of the writers, photographers, or... Yeah, McKenna Malin is, um, she writes for Utah Business Magazine. She's also our editor for Salty Magazine. And, of course, she's a writer herself. Um, And then we have Angelica Brewer, who is Ogden's Poet Laureate. Um, She's written a few pieces for us. Um, And then we have A.J. Turner. He's written a few pieces as well. He's a local writer, um, as well as his day job is, I believe, somewhere in the marketing realm for a van company. Um, And then we have uh, Todd and then Cam, myself. Um, and then we have uh, Ian Casey, who, who does a lot of different things. He does uh, photography. He does a lot of the story design and layout for us. He looks really good. He always looks so good at the yeah. movies. It always makes me feel like he's a, a lovely human. He's, yeah. um, oh, my gosh. Oh, and then Cole and Eisenhower, Cole. Um, who's a local il- illustrator and 
muralist and artist of yeah. sorts, and he's been doing some really cool interactive pieces for us, as well as, cor- of course, just some pretty sweet illustrations that haven't really been published yet. And I yeah. hope I didn't forget anyone. Yeah, Dream Team. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's that's everybody who's had their fingers on it, you mm-hmm. know. And then Andy. Andy Prims is doing the, he's really, imp- like, instrumental in doing the layout and getting, we have all this content, right? All these stories created, all these great photos, but he's helping to lay it out. And he's also helping to teach a lot of people on our team who are interested in layout design for magazine and print. So there's a really cool learning aspect and teaching aspect there. Yep. Wow, that's a lot. I have right. one final question yeah. to sort of wrap it around to what's going on with Oka, just because we do have you here. Um, what can you tell us about the current state of the board? Um, what we have sort of looking forward as far as as this this current exhibition, which is Utah State Show wraps up what do we have to look forward to kind of coming into the first of the year yeah so right now it's the utah statewide annual and it's a whole bunch of utah artists whose art is in there and it's incredible all different kinds of different local utah artists um so go check that out they're there till uh sometime in january so there's probably about roughly a month left then all of that art will come down and we have a next artist coming up um i'm not going to pronounce her name correctly so she just does. You came on the right show to <laughs> mispronounce things. <laughs> yeah. Tamara. Um, her I'm famous for not pronouncing things yeah. correctly, by the way. So. so her show starts in February, and it's going to be really excellent. She does these amazing fabric um, installations kind of based around, uh, not always, but around like um, carcass, um, animal, ren- like uh, it's very, very wow. interesting. Is it like taxidermy? Kind of, but it's with really beautiful soft fabric, and that's not the pretty sole focus. taxidermy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I Is don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to undercut her art by any means if I'm getting it totally wrong. Um, and then, so she's in February, and then we have, um, I believe, Oka. Okay, I'm actually not aware yet, 100, percent but they have their next artist in resident who will be starting, I think, in March. Um, And so this gentleman will be starting in March and he'll be available for the community. The last artist in resident we had was Yala Ford. She was really great at implementing herself and integrating herself into the community. Um, um, So there's a lot going on. We do actually have some vacant board seats. So if anyone is interested in joining, joining, it's really great. Um, Todd's not doing much. I know. He should Only if he wasn't here right now, we'd vote him in. Yes. (laughs) Oh, that's so funny. Bathroom break, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> <That's so funny. laughs> yeah, but there's a lot of really great stuff going on. I mean, I, I think you should really get down to Oka and see their current ex- exhibits because they're the artists are really fantastic. Kelly, um, do you consider yourself an artist? No, I do not. No, well, she manages artists. See, what is your what do you love about or what do you enjoy about working with artists as someone who's not one? I mean, it's just really amazing to see what people create. I literally cannot wrap my brain around how people make things and how they dream up these ideas and then actually do them. I just find it really remarkable. I mean, I play with spreadsheets, which is really boring um, and not remarkable. So I just think that their talent and putting themselves out there is is really fantastic. That's a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a huge part of it. Well, thank you guys so much for yeah. spending the evening with us. Yeah, that was uh, fun. We've I gone, feel like we just touched on things. Yeah, so I, much more to talk I could about. go another hour, but you're going to have to pay extra for that. That's part of a <laughs> monthly fee that we offer here. At the, <laughs> that we will be. That we will be yeah. offering at Ogden Arts and Adventure. It's called the After Hours with uh, the McClouds, I think is what we... <laughs> <laughs> that's the next business venture? <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's not mu- like a hundred bucks a month, you know. I mean, it's kind of it is worth every penny. Every penny, mm-hmm. and you get exclusive access to the trailer and one beer. Yep, one beer, free, one, beer. one free beer. Yeah, yeah, that seems fair. Uh, okay, real <laughs> quick adventure news, uh, and I do have an update from our friend Corey Davis from Ogden Avalanche, who we we recorded this earlier. But there are five places in the world that Snowbrains claims are the best places to ski and surf. Any ideas in the same day in the same day ski and surf in the same day japan yeah oh you can in japan i don't think japan made the list actually wow okay uh we've got australia ben lomond 
Ben Lomond National Park, Australia. New uh, Zealand. Um, probably Big Bear, California. I was going to say somewhere in California. Nova Scotia. That's Cape Breton. Iceland. Bassett. Ooh, Iceland would be cool. Carabasset Valley, Maine. Mm. I don't know who makes these lists or, you know, if they consulted you at all. But um, And then, very famous in the world today, today especially, Todd was talking about this country earlier, um, Marrakesh. The Atlas Mountain, okay. Mountains, Marrakesh, Morocco. In the same day? You yeah, could be okay. in the mountains of Marrakesh and then... Yeah, I mean, it'd be the like Atlas a several-hour drive, but you could do that. I'm thinking like snow to... The last time I've done snow to surf wasn't ski snow, but like there's, what, I mean, there's a couple of the islands even in Hawaii where you could do that, hmm. where you get some snow at the top and you could surf. They the must water. be qualifying it with like a yeah, ski like resort. A resort that you could ski. Oh, That's maybe. awesome. Yeah, I don't know. All right, here's this week's Ogden Avalanche update from. We get to hear Corey Davis. Our before. friend, uh, Corey Davis. Yeah. Good. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Time out. Let me start that over. Like, does he have a theme song? Yeah, he's got his own theme song. <laughs> does no, he? No. But of course he does. When I put Spotify. He's such a playing, unicorn. He, should, he is a unicorn. <laughs> Background. All right. This start, it starts with our friend's um, wonderful laugh, I think. Is what, yeah, there we go. Corey Hanging Davis. out here with Corey Davis, halfway across the country in Eden proper. Yes. No, where are you? Yes, Eden. Istanbul. Even I'm on Est- the Mediterranean. <laughs> oh, uh, on the in the med. Very good. Well, what are the snow conditions like this week in our backcountry, Mr. Ogden Avalanche? I know you have a slideshow here, so let's see if we can add it to the there we go. Here we are. Yeah, there yeah. we go. So yeah. Little update from our last update, which was last Wednesday, which is November 30th. So it's been almost a week, six days. Um, since the bash, we've done pretty well with snow. You can see here the Ben Loman snow stake. We're sitting at an HS of 26 inches. You can multiply that and get the centimeters for depth there. But um, pretty good base for early December up on Ben Loman and at both of our ski areas. Um, we have seen widespread cracking and collapsing a- across the Ogden Mountains um, with that last snowstorm, uh, the night of the bash and into the weekend. Um, we saw some natural avalanche activity, not a ton, but a lot of human triggered avalanches, uh, both intentionally and unintentionally. The ski areas had really good luck with explosives. If you want to click to that third slide there, Brandon, of no name. Keep going. Boom. So you can see here FTG at, at no name at Snow Basin went uh, with an explosive trigger uh, to the ground. So that's a, a good result up there on FTG. And then that first slide there is going to be um, up on the south or the east side of Cutler Ridge. Go one more. Um, we had a remote trigger from a party moving below. There it is, the slope. Uh, and they were able to remotely trigger this on old snow on the ground, weak snow on the ground um, from below. Hard slab up there on Cutler Ridge. And then you can see the middle photo on Monte Cristo. Um, there it is. Some good cracking there from Mike Fogg and our motorized community up on Monte Cristo. But wherever you travel in the mountains currently, we're seeing a lot of cracking and collapsing, which is a red flag. Also, recent avalanches. So... Lots of red flags out there. Uh, the avalanche danger today is mainly moderate with considerable at upper and mid elevations on north aspects. Um, and that should continue through the week, um, probably trending downward into moderate uh, with uh, clear and no snow on the horizon um, through the week. So that's kind of what we're looking at. I know we got a video here preloaded of Greg Gagney up at Powder Mountain. Uh, doing an ECT, and this will kind of show the how unstable our snowpack is. ECT of five. ECT five, and it propagates across the whole block. Slides easily on those those facets that formed on the snow surface during our high pressure. Yeah, dangerous structure. Yeah, and you can find the rest of that observation on the UAC's website. Um, under the OBS tab, just go to uh, the Ogden zone. 
besides that, um, that's our update for the week. In other right. news, yeah, we have a fundraiser on Saturday, Brandon. At our yes, we lunch. do. I know. Am I? Are. Am I going to see you there? I'll be there. Okay. Okay. I. Okay. I'm just curious. I uh, can time. I can. Uh, what's it called in Star Trek? Where they like press the button? <laughs> go through the little portal and just show yeah. up there uh-huh. yeah i'll it's beam you up warp. yeah beam me up brandon i'll, be, I'll <laughs> beam you up i'll beam you over beam, beam me over to arbor <laughs> to yeah arbor. we're gonna show yeah. tgr's video we got some more raffle prizes and uh it's gonna be a good time uh besides that heading into the new year we don't have anything on the calendars most people are out and about and then uh B Street starts on January 12th. Let me make sure that's correct. But I think yep, that January is correct. 12th. Yep. January 12th at Roosters B Street will be our first one. And that's actually Jim Steenberg, uh, Professor Pow. Uh, he also writes the Wasatch Weather Weenies blog um, <laughs> and literally wrote the book on snow in the Wasatch. So that should be a fun talk. You may be watching this on Ogden Avalanche's YouTube page. And if so, congratulations, you, you made it. Uh, but this is premiering on the Ogden Arts and Adventure podcast, which is a weekly podcast here in town that we do. So thank you, Corey, for this updated segment. And then we'll just segment out this little section and then we'll throw it up there on the Ogden Avalanche YouTube. And it's now new on the Ogden Avalanche blog. Correct. Yeah, last week okay. is up on the blog. Sweet. I did yeah. it. You did it. it. I'm very proud of you. (laughs) Yeah. What? That was all right. That was not too shabby. Yeah. So I listen to four minutes of him every week. We we (laughs) cut that before the show, obviously. And so we will show that here on this show. And you can also find it on the Ogden Avalanche YouTube page. And then he's going to post it on the Ogden Avalanche blog each week. And so you can get a weekly update of our conditions here in Ogden. Oh, Brandon, he's going to be impossible. I know. He's already famous, but then now with the weekly. <laughs> oh, my gosh. People are just going to oh, confront Corey. him on the street, on the straight, mountain. Straight to his it is, it is oh, one of those things where head. you should watch it, too. But you should watch the YouTube if you haven't subscribed to Ogden Avalanche or, or ours, Ogden Arts and Adventure, because the, he is going to bring some slides. He, he said, hey, can I bring a slideshow? And he had slides, imagery, and a video. So we have to play all the things. And so if you are listening to this on the podcast version, I suggest you take the time to watch it on the YouTube and see our wonderful, beautiful faces, and also Corey's slideshow. So there is that. Uh, Thanks so much, Cam and Kelly, for joining us today on the podcast. Kelly, how many podcasts have you been on? Mm, I think this is two. Two, okay. Cam, are you a pro? I wouldn't call myself a pro. Okay, not there yet. This is what, like, they've all been your podcasts. Oh, you haven't been on others? No. Okay. I don't think so. They can't afford you. That's why. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's say that. I only make time for you guys. I, that's I appreciate that. To, yeah. 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 Thank you to Banyan One for powering today's episode of the Ogden Arts and Adventure Show. Listen and subscribe to the Ogden Arts and Adventure Show on YouTube. You can find us on Facebook. We still show up there. Instagram, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, thebanyancollective.com. There's a Podbean app where you can get all of our stuff on Android and iPhones and like your favorite podcast app. DM us on Instagram if you want to be on the show. It's at Ogden Adventure. And we'll take you out this week with a, again, this is launching tomorrow night. So if you're listening to this in the afternoon, you get to hear it before it launches on the YouTube. It is from uh, Hectic Hobo Van Sessions that we recorded live here at the Monarch what? building. How did you guys get Hectic Hobo? They are they are famous, <laughs> the famouses. And this is their title track off their new album, uh, American Bison. American Bison. Yeah, here we go. was a pet and zoo with an ill gifts that's probably you want and on the road it's hard to find good food 
to forever and reminisce If you get the ankles, then I'll get the wrist Uh -huh. Winter frost and nostril mist Espresso bar would help so please In order to promote our stories We'll need to minimize the glories Facilities key, so keep your cool Don't plop your pies into our pool Look up, hold still, don't move I said, oh great, you turn your fucking heads Driver, take us out of this door Oh, 
so good.